God dag, Boroken! That is Swedish for good day, everybody. And I'm not just speaking Swedish randomly. Today's film for discussion is actually a Swedish film. As a matter of fact, of all the 25 films that we're going to be talking about this year, um, it is the only foreign language film uh, that we'll be discussing. Um, I, at one point, I wanted to include um, Fassbinder's Berlin Alexanderplatz, but we couldn't figure out which of the other films to eliminate, so we left it off the list. And so we're left with this, Fanny and Alexander, uh, the 1983 Academy Award winner for Best Foreign Language Film, as well as Ingmar Bergman's final film that he directed for theatrical release. And so our guests for today are Natalie Zitter, an education associate from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Matt Polis, a sound designer for film and television who hails from Boulder, Colorado. So I want to thank you both for sitting through a three-hour Swedish melodrama. What did you think? Matty P., you're first. It was a, uh, a good movie. I liked it a lot. And I would recommend it to people if that's the kind of, you know, it's like, see this movie. However, I would preface that by saying it gets better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at some point, it, it, it changed direction and it got much more interesting. And, and like I said, looking back, it's actually much more interesting having, say, watching it the second time to see that first 30, 40 minutes after having seen the rest of it. The first time through, I felt it was, I just was a little bit uh, impatient, I guess you could say. I'll have to agree. Uh, I liked it. And in the beginning, it was very boring. I thought it was very well shot. I liked the Ingmar Bergman style of, you know, light and dark and, you know, his concentration on the theatrical life, which he loved and all that stuff. Basically, you're seeing all these people you, you don't know in their environment and there's no introduction to anybody. It's very... I had a real hard time keeping track of the characters. Well, and one of the reasons, yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely. did too. And I think one of the reasons is because, um, well, they don't describe anything. They, don't, they sort of come in and out and do whatever they need to do based on the context of that moment, not based on a narrative uh, arc. But the relationships are, you know, husband and wife, which are so unclear because the, the husband's usually twice the age of the wife. And, and adultery or whatever flings are, are commonplace as much as marriage. You see them with all sorts of relationships. Among the bourgeois class. Well, this in movie this, has a definite class system dichotomy. Right. It's in, the, one of several dichotomies in the film. Right. It's not clear who's with who. So then we can't get exactly relationships from clear, you know, landmarks that we might use. Um, there are characters that they spend time on. Like I remember seeing, do you remember Carl? Uncle Carl? Oh my God. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Yeah. And I thought that that was Oscar at one point. See, there you go. And I said, wait a second, I thought he was having an affair. And you don't realize so one. much later that Oscar is actually out of Fanny and Alexander's father. I think that's one, I mean, one of the reasons why we might find it boring is because we're not short to latch on to. No one seems important or unimportant. Because the, the tone of the film at that midway point shifts dramatically. The dichotomy comes from Bergman's childhood because mm. you know, he, all, he comes from both a religious childhood and a bourgeois childhood. In hindsight, because of the, the happiness and joy of the first half. Although as boring as it, some of it was, I missed it. All I wanted to do was go back. When it, yeah. when it was gone and sure. we were in this stark religious you know, environment. Yeah. They're almost two different films. They are. There's a number of moments um, and another dichotomy that the film has, and that is melodrama versus fantasy. That whole scene where they're put in the, in the trunk and then Isaac screams and then you see them on the floor. It was I a, thought that they died or something. I wasn't quite sure. It was a very bizarre moment. That was the moment that I was really concerned with. But that's when I got interested, though. And, and the idea was, uh, and it took me research to figure this out, is his screaming was supposed to project an image, right. a mental image of the kids on the floor so that the, the evil bishop right. you know, didn't think that they were being stolen when they actually were hidden away in the trunk. Yeah, I mean, it was an I actually didn't like the editing there. It was like the filmmaking of it was a little, little clunky, I thought, but it, they, it was, a, it was well, a good sequence. It's a big question. It's a tonal issue. Because there's these very honest, you know, scenes, uh, you know, slices of life. You're observing this family and their, and their issues. And then there's these, like, moments of uh, fancy. And what was false about this one to me is it did not come, because a lot of them come from Alexander's imagination. That's, and that's great. This, this didn't seem to come from anybody's imagination. It was just, it was all part of this escape, which is supposed to be the climax of the film, or certainly the storyline. It didn't, wasn't necessary, like, because they were in the trunk, you know, they could have just fooled the Bush bishop without having this whole pr projecting well, you, idea. I did like the movie very, very much. Um, and um, one of the main reasons is, I just thought it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and I thought the, the shots were amazing, and just amazingly detailed, like, Paintings. I thought it was an amazing uh, period piece 
accomplishment in the sense that it didn't just look like it was about that period. It looked like it was almost made in that period. Obviously not literally. I mean, our cinematography now is a little more vibrant and crisp, and you know, so even just by today's standards, it was a little bit older looking. But maybe that had something to do with my current reaction to it. But but I also think that I, I think that it had a lot to do with the style he was trying to employ. To, to you know, he was doing a period piece, and so therefore yeah, yeah. it was. No, but he did it really. Like, he did it really. It looked it looked old and in a good way. It looked like like paintings of the period, like yeah. Vermeer or something like that. Like it didn't look like Shakespeare in Love. You know, like that looks like it was made today about something else. This was Agreed. like. That was a really good. That was a good reference. Now you have thoughts. There's that scene with the mummy, where it's breathing and mm -hmm. and the way that the light's shining on the mummy. Um, it's one of those light and dark moments. That exactly, you were to exactly. And just the way that it was shot, you, it was really a, a great sense of just eeriness. I was trying to follow the music throughout and see if there was music or not, or if it was all kind of diegetic or not. And, and at that point where he's... It was sparse music. Very sparse. And there's even one really funny moment where it seems like there's a uh, score, and they're having dinner, and it's almost like this and airplane he, movie, an airplane pans, scene. It pans over, there's an orchestra in the kitchen. They have an orchestra in the kitchen. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, it was very funny. All right, guys, we're going to do something a little different for closing thoughts today, um, at, based on some emails we've received. Um, I'm going to ask you to rank the film on a scale of 1 to 10, so we can sort of have a parameter of like of how you feel. I give it an 8. Despite the slow parts and the parts that I might have skipped upon first viewing, I think I, I still respect it as a very intentional movie, and I think it was really well done, intelligently made. You just got to get through some parts, and then you'll appreciate them later. I would say 7. It was long, and you do have to get through the boring parts in the beginning, not to just echo everything that we've said. I have viewed it as a window into a child's mind, if you want to make it that Well, I mean, I, I agree that it has elements of that, but then there's so many scenes where Alexander, you know, it's not from his perspective, and it's totally, you know, with, with the adults. So that's, again, part of the dichotomy. It's like, you, you know, you think you're in this child's imagination. There's these whole other sections that he's got nothing to do with. I also, I also give the film an eight. Um, because it, I, the, the only thing that brings it down, I think, is incredibly so, slow f at, at points, and, and there's a, you know scenes that you just don't need. But otherwise, moments of, of cinematic brilliance, really, really detailed, nuanced film direction. The elements, cinematography, design, both won Oscars, uh, were just really, really extraordinary. So it's time to wrap things up. I want to say thank you once again to Natalie and Maddie P for coming out and participating with us today. Greed is good this week on Real 13 on October 4th, 2008. We will see Michael Douglas in his Oscar-winning performance as the now iconic Gordon Gecko in Oliver Stone's 1987 film, Wall Street. After Wall Street will be the Real 13 short that you will have chosen on real13.org and the indie this week is the winner of the 2006 Independent Spirit Award for Best Film Made for Under $500,000. Appropriately enough, it's the politically themed romance, The Conventioneers, which was made during the 2004 Republican National Convention here in New York City. For more information, stills, or trailers for any of these or any of the other Real 13 films, check out the Real 13 Facebook fan page and become a fan. You become more involved. As far as film revision is concerned, we'll be back in two weeks with a discussion of the very popular British comedy, Educating Rita. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.